Hello and welcome to another episode of Just in Time Worlds. Today I would like to discuss outlaw guilds in fantasy. What I mean by an outlaw guild is any organization that acts outside the law, normally for main profit, and is in fact organized into some kind of hierarchy. What am I talking about? Well, mostly about thieves' guilds. I would like to discuss whether thieves' guilds were in fact a historical thing, if they were, how, how did they come to be, and how are guilds like that used in fantasy today, in mainstream fantasy. And finally, I'll wrap up by giving you some tips and tricks for building your own memorable thieves' guild. My name is Marie Mullaney, and this is another episode of Just In Time Worlds. If you like this kind of world building content, please do subscribe down below. Okay, let's get cracking. There is actually quite a lot of historical support for a thieves guild type of organization, starting with Jonathan Wilde's Gang of Thieves when he was the thief taker general in London and going through to the Corsa Nostra who grew to power during the Prohibition years and leading on into today's drug cartels. We have many criminal organizations who have been well organized to prey upon society. Even on a smaller scale, criminals will often organize into gangs who control perhaps just a few city blocks, but they allow no other criminals into their turf and can be classified as an outlaw organization. Let's take a look at a couple of the historical examples and try and identify the elements that allowed these organizations to become what they are. The first organization I'd like to discuss is Jonathan Wilde's Gang of Thieves during the time period when he was the Thief Taker General of London. It is important to note here that Jonathan Wilde himself was what we typically call a criminal born of the prison system. He was put into debtor's prison for not being able to cover his debts and in prison he learned how to be a criminal. Wilde was also invited to become one of the Thief Takers of London. This was before there was a proper policing system in England and the thief takers were paid a bounty for the capture of criminals. Wilde, on the one hand, had a criminal organization and on the other was part of the legal system. This foot in either world setup allowed him to use the legal system to bring about the death and incarceration of his rivals in the criminal world, as well as absolutely coining it in both the legal world and the criminal world. Wilde ended up running a very tight criminal ship. He tolerated no rivals and would use either his criminal organization or the law or both to ensure that he had no rivals and that whatever crime occurred in London, he took his slice of the pie. This is a very important element in this type of organization. Whether by using the threat of the law or by using the direct threat of breaking your opponent's legs if they operate on your turf, it is important for any outlaw organization to maintain the integrity of their turf by ensuring that no other organization can poach their clientele. Their clientele in this case being the people they prey on. If you are more interested in learning about Jonathan Wilde, there's a great video by Extra Credits which is linked in the information link and in the description down below. Jonathan Wilde's gang came to be as it was because of a general lawlessness that was available in London due to a lack of proper policing. And that is also a trademark of these types of organizations. Even a street gang needs an environment that fosters their existence. A street gang is unlikely to prosper in an environment where the neighborhood trusts the authority of the law. However, the societal contract can break down due to unintended consequences of poorly considered laws, and that is what happened during the prohibition in America which forbade the sale and manufacture of alcohol. This turned a lot of otherwise law-abiding citizens into criminals. There's a great quote by General Douglas MacArthur of the United States that says, Never give an order that can't be obeyed. The same applies to the law. If there is a law that is generally not followed by the bulk of your population, your judicial system breaks down. The judicial system is built to deal with the periphery of the population not being law-abiding. 
it depends on the bulk of society following the social contract for the judicial system to work. During the prohibition, people were in a position where they were breaking the law just for consuming alcohol, and this led to a more general sense of lawlessness. That sense of lawlessness gave the Cosa Nostra a fertile ground in which to grow. The Cosa Nostra was originally born of the Sicilian mafia, which Italian immigrants had brought with them to America. They started out as booze runners during the Prohibition and expanded out from there into various organized crime activities like protection, racketeering, kidnapping and fraud. Because of their long and rich history as a criminal organization, the mob have a fascinating language and rituals around their activity. They refer to things like the made man being a full member of the mob. There is the boss, the consigliere, who run the organization. This kind of language and titles gives them a certain amount of mystique to the outside eye. Which is not to say that I in any way support the mob. I think that no criminal organization should be tolerated. From a fantasy world-building perspective, it's a very rich element of the organization, the language that they speak internal to themselves, the titles that they use. It's also interesting to note that the mob controlled various cities by means of mob bosses, but they didn't control the whole of America's crime as one unified organization. There was a lot of negotiations between families to not interfere in each other's turf, and of course later there were gang wars with newer criminal organizations. Today we do have nation-spanning criminal organizations like the drug cartels. However, they are supported by the fact that we have communication and travel networks that enable a criminal organization to grow to this size. In a medieval fantasy setting, it is highly unlikely that you could sustain such an organization. And I think that covers the real-world historical elements. Let's take a look at some fantasy thieves' guilds. The first organization that I want to talk about is Raymond E. Faist's Mockers. Now, the Mockers of Crondor is probably one of the most iconic thieves' guilds of fantasy. They are a city-wide thieves' guild of the city of Crondor called the Mockers. They have positions that control their activities, ranging from the upright man who is in charge of the thieves guild overall, to the day master who governs daytime activities and the night master who governs nighttime activities. The mockers have that mystique element that I was talking about earlier that the Corsa Nostra have, and they have that because they have many of the same kind of elements. They have a special headquarters where they hang out, they use passphrases like there's a party at mother's. They have special names for titles. Their leader is called the upright man. They have the day master and the night master. They have special terms for things like they call the rooftops the thieves highway. This forms an internal thieves cant that they all talk. And so you get the sense that the Mockers are both a highly organized gang that control the whole of Crondo's underbelly and that they have a rich history and tradition backing up their criminal activities. So if you're building such an organization that have control of a city, it is worth thinking about their internal language and the titles that they use to refer to things. And I'm not talking about making up a unique language like Elven. I'm talking about the jargon that your Thieves Guild uses to refer to their activities, the passphrases that they use, and the titles that they use to refer to their leaders. Let's take a look at another Thieves Guild, this one from Trudy Canavan's World of the Black Magician. The Thieves' Guild in this world was born from the initiating event of the Purge. Now, the Purge is an annual event organized by the king where the poor who live in the, the capital city are swept out of the city unless they can prove that they have a residence within the city. 
So they are forced outside of the walls of the city and there they have to exist in the slums. Now, what happened was the, when the first time that the purge took place, there were those who banded together in order to form protection for the people who have been ejected out of the city and to provide kind of the rudiments of a controlling organization. And from this was born the Thieves Guild. Now, what they do is they lend money to people in order to get them on their feet in this terrible situation of having been thrown out of the city, then the people need to pay them back. They also run thievery, protection racketeering, and all the rest of that, but it originated from the event of the purge, which is a really interesting backstory, because remember when I spoke about the mafia being caused by the prohibition, it's the same situation here. The legal authorities took an action that was ill-considered. Unintended side effect was the creation of a very powerful criminal organization because they set up a situation where normal, average, everyday people were turned into criminals through very little fault of their own. That is always a very interesting initiating event for your thieves' guild that approach of the authorities taking an action that had ill-considered and unintended side effects. So that's the Thieves' Guild from Trudy Canavan's series. But what about other outlaw style of organizations? The last organization I want to discuss is that of Catherine Kerr's Silver Daggers. The Silver Daggers feature heavily in Catherine Kerr's books, and the principle around them is that they are a mercenary band, but you don't just get to join this band, nor do they ride together as a single war band. If you are exiled from your home, you can find another silver dagger and ride along with them in a sort of apprenticeship. And if that silver dagger judges that you will not shame their name, he will initiate you into the band and take you to a smith who serves the silver daggers. And that smith will make you one of their titular silver daggers, which you will then carry. The interesting thing about this organization is that they are a distributed organization. There is no central leadership to the Silver Daggers. There is no shared sense of purpose. They're simply a group of men who share a similar backstory in that they have dishonored themselves in some way and have been exiled from their homes. They carry these silver daggers to show that they are at least trustworthy in that if you pay them, they will fight for you. This kind of distributed organization works really well if you are building something that is based around a single activity. In this example, it's a type of mercenary. If you pay a silver dagger his asking fee, he will fight for you and he will stick to your contract. I can also see distributed organizations working really well for assassins' guilds. So the assassin has some means of being identified and there is some structure around how to contact them, how to hire them and how to know that the job has been done without there being a formal structure of guild leadership and a hierarchy. So if you're building single organization structures like a mercenary guild, a assassin's guild, things like that, it's worth considering doing a distributed guild that isn't actually a formal controlling structure, but is more about those members sticking to contract. So those three examples are my best examples from fantasy. Comment down below. Let me know what other iconic thieves guild type organizations you like in fantasy. And let me give you a quick summary of my approach to building such an organization. My first step is do not go overboard. A kingdom wide organization that controls every aspect of crime across multiple cities is probably going overboard. It is unlikely that such an organization would exist without a very strong historical reason. So if you're going to build such a large criminal empire, you're going to need a lot of backstory. The second tip is to build something iconic into your organization. 
something around the jargon that they use or the titles that they use or an item that they carry. The mockers have their titles and their name. The Thieves Guild from the Black Magician world, all of their leaders are called by animal names like the rat, the snake, the spider and so on. The Silver Daggers have their titular Silver Dagger. These things make those guilds memorable. They make them stand out in the minds of people who are consuming your world, whether that be as players in a role-playing game or as readers. And the last point, and this seems extremely obvious, and yet I've seen so many authors get it wrong. Remember, this is a criminal organization. They are out to make money. Not every criminal organization is a Robin Hood-style crime syndicate that gives money to the poor. Most of them are not going to give money to the poor. They're going to prey on the poor. Please don't turn your criminal organization into your main heroic group and lose track of the fact that they are a criminal organization. Also, don't confuse them with militant organizations who are seeking to engender societal change. That is a very different kind of organization. If you would like me to discuss an organization like that, an organization which might be doing illegal things, but is not a criminal organization per se, but rather an organization striving for societal change, let me know in the comments and I will cover that in a future video. Okay, that was my story about thieves' guilds and outlaw organizations in fantasy. If you like this kind of content, please do hit the thumbs up button. It really does help with the algorithm. And I will see you soon for another episode of Just in Time Worlds.